The CAP Center has this purpose to bring people together to discuss in a civil manner important issues of our time. It's an outreach of the University of California at Santa Barbara to engage the public in important conversation about major ethical, moral issues that confront all of us in today's world. These lectures are part of a larger program at, at the CAP Center, and recently we have slightly changed the, the name of the CAP Center, and I want to alert you to that. The new name of the CAP Center officially is the Walter H. CAP Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Public Life. The word ethics has been inserted because so many people have asked us to address larger ethical issues, some that are explicitly not religious, some that are, are of course religious, depending on how you define the word religious. But clearly, one of the new thrusts for the CAP Center is to broaden the scope of issues that we will be focusing upon. And I think if you check the program that is on your seat, you'll see for this fall uh, the kinds of lectures that we will be providing here, uh, mostly here at uh, Victoria Hall. You might take that home with you and, uh, and, and keep in mind the dates. And of course, I always encourage you to take a look at our website, www.capcenter.ucsb.edu, and you will see, uh, you'll see lots of things, including the fact Aside from our programs, you'll also see that we raise money. We are delighted to have been the beneficiary of a very prestigious award from the National Endowment for the Humanities, $500,000 two years ago. That's the good news. The bad news is that we have to raise three bucks for every one buck they give us. And of course we do solicit funds for the continued support and what we hope will be the perpetual support for this kind of outreach to the public in, in the Central Coast and Santa Barbara area. Another thing that we do at the CAP Center is to have a visiting professor one quarter each academic year, the CAP's visiting professor, who teaches what we call the CAP Seminar. And the CAP Seminar is a seminar of graduate students and selected undergraduate students who have good records of achievement, which is also open to the public if people would like to sit in. And that seminar focuses upon some kind of major issue um, of the time. And this year, I'm delighted to introduce our CAPS visiting professor, and that's Professor Colleen McDaniel, who is sitting right down here. And she's with us for this quarter. She's from the University of Utah. And will be teaching a seminar, the exact title of which, Religion and Visual Media. And Religion and Visual Culture. So it'll be something about the, you know, the impact of media and the visual image on how we think uh, with respect to uh, things like religion and morality and values, and things like that. So welcome, Colleen, to uh, Santa Barbara, and look forward to having you at the university. And Colleen will also be doing a presentation, if you notice, on the program uh, later in the fall. And she also has an exhibit, which will be at the Carpelles Museum, uh, Library Museum. Uh, I think it's called Picturing Faith, which is uh, a very interesting collection of, of pictures that was taken by the United States government during the Depression and thereafter. Uh, and, and you'll be hearing more about that, uh, that collection. I also want to introduce my colleague with whom I could not operate without, uh, and that's Leonard Wallach, who's sitting down here, the Associate Director of the CAP Center. And I also want to introduce the new chair of the Department of Religious Studies, a post that I used to hold, but uh, I'm now on sabbatical and doing less, less things. But the new chair of the Department of Religious Studies is David White, who is sitting over here. Our 
Our speaker this evening is Gillian Martin Sorensen, Senior Advisor at the United Nations Foundation and a national advocate on matters related to the United Nations and in particular the United States-United Nations relationship. She addresses audiences as diverse as Rotary International, the Air Force Academy, university students, staff and members of Congress, newspaper editorial writers, and television correspondents. In her capacity in charge of external relations at the United Nations, she in the past was responsible for outreach to civil society, including non-governmental organizations around the world. She was the contact point for the Secretary General in relation between the United Nations and parliamentarians, the academic world, religious leaders, and other groups committed to peace, justice, development, and human rights. As a member of the Secretary General's inner circle, she had a role in his communication strategy as well as schedule planning. Prior to that assignment, Mrs. Sorensen served for four years, 1993-1996, as Special Advisor for Public Policy to Secretary General, to the Secretary General of the United Nations. As the official overseeing the global commemoration, she led the planning of conferences, debates, documentaries, concerts, and exhibits, the preparation of books and curricular materials, and the coordination of the UN 50 Summit at headquarters in New York, in which 180 presidents and prime ministers participated. Mrs. Sorensen earlier served for over 12 years on appointment by Mayor Edward Koch as New York City's Commissioner for the United Nations and Consular Corps, head of the city's liaison with the world's largest diplomatic community. Her responsibilities included matters related to diplomatic security and immunity, housing and education, and other cultural and business contacts between the host city and over 30,000 diplomats. She secured federal reimbursement to New York City for cost of diplomatic protection, which continues to this day. In the fall of 2002, she was on leave of absence from the United Nations and was a fellow at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. She's a graduate of Smith College and studied at the Sorbonne. She's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Women's Forum, and the Women's Foreign Policy Group. She previously served as a board member of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting on appointment by the President of the United States. In addition to her public service, she has been active in politics and was a delegate to three national presidential conversations. Excuse me, conventions. Some kind of conversation. Tonight she will speak with a topic on the topic of the United States and the United Nations can this marriage be saved? Please join me in welcoming Gillian Sorensen. Thank you, Dr. Roof, and good evening, everybody. It is a delight for me to be here in beautiful Santa Barbara on this beautiful day. It's my first visit here, so it is really a treat. I think you all know something that uh, the rest of us have missed. And I'm very honored and happy to be here at this event sponsored by the CAPS Center for Ethics, Religion, and Public Life. I congratulate you, Dr. Roof, for all that you have done for your inspired leadership and in launching this important new initiative. Too often there is a disconnect between ethics and public life, and I'd like to see that that finds us a way to meet and to serve each other. And I'm very happy to see here some of my friends from the United Nations Association and from Pax 2100 and from Direct Relief International and from the Santa Barbara Committee on Foreign Relations, and of course thanks to UC Santa Barbara for supporting this as well. I am, as I said to someone earlier this evening, riding the circuit. I left the United Nations after many, many years last October, and the reason I'm doing that is because it had become painfully clear to me 
that there was a gap, if not a chasm, between the United Nations itself and the American public or the understanding in the American public of what the UN was and, and did and what our stake was in its success. So I've had the opportunity in this last year to travel to all parts of the country, north, south, east, and west, and all kinds of audiences, from church basements to enormous convention halls, uh, to talk about just this. Now the title of my talk, The U.S. and the U.N., Can This Marriage Be Saved?, is only half in jest. And I will answer it at once and say, yes, of course it can be saved, and of course it must be. But I will acknowledge that this long marriage is under strain and perhaps in need of therapy. At the outset, let me admit my bias. I was for these last 12 years an international civil servant appointed by the Secretary General, actually two in succession. And I was an international civil servant who happened to be American. So what I bring to this discussion is a sort of inside-outside perspective of one who's worked there for many years but has watched the American, the US-UN uh, issue at close hand. I am, you clearly would understand, a devoted supporter of the UN but not uncritical. And I am committed by both choice and conviction to multilateralism. That is to say, I believe that nearly always we do better when we work with other nations than when we go it alone. <laughs> Next year will mark the 60th anniversary of the UN's birth. It was, as many of you know, conceived in the mind of Franklin Roosevelt as early as 1941, in the midst of the war. And he was convinced that this time, when that war ended, it would be different from World War I. The U.S. would put itself in the lead, in the forefront, of a new organization for peace. And one symbol of that would be offering this country as the home base for the new organization. And when Roosevelt died and Truman picked up on that, um, he too pursued it uh, immediately and with the understanding that it needed bipartisan support for the charter to be ratified by the U.S. Congress. So the U.S. was in the lead from the very beginning. And the U.N. Charter, the language in the charter, reflects the very words of our own historic documents. It begins, we the peoples determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the worth and dignity of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and nations large and small, and on it goes. Does that sound familiar in some way? The framework, the brilliant framework of our founders still stands. You know it well, I'm sure, the Security Council, the General Assembly, Trusteeship Council and the Secretariat, and the International Court of Justice in The Hague. And those original functions, especially peace and security, still stand. But the founders could hardly have imagined the vast and diverse array of responsibilities that the UN attends to today. In 1945, there were just 51 member states. Now that number is 191. We consider it to be universal coverage of the, all the Earth. And despite its flaws and imperfections, for millions around the world, the UN embodies their hopes and aspirations. And for most people, it is understood that the UN can serve both the national interest as well as the global interest. At a time when news coverage is consumed by Iraq, and we'll come back to that, we have to, it is useful to recall some unwritten stories of the UN at work. And I'll move quickly through this little litany, but I want to frame it in, I want to put it in the larger frame. You know, of course, of peacekeeping. That's what gets the headlines. Did you know there are 15 peacekeeping missions underway today in the Congo, in Liberia, 
in East Timor, on the border of India and Pakistan and Kashmir and so on and so on. Do you recall the work of the United Nations in disarmament, nuclear arms, chemical and biological weapons, banning of landmines and the, the trade in small arms as well? It's good to remember UN's work in development, that is helping the poorest of the poor in promoting good governance and also free and fair elections, as well as helping the poor have clean water and elementary education and so forth. Do you remember the UN's work in human rights? Not just setting norms and standards as they did in the beginning, but putting the spotlight on the worst offenders and calling people to account and speaking up for, for those who are unjustly imprisoned. And do remember the world, UN's work on humanitarian relief today, today looking after 20 million refugees, giving them safety and shelter and food until they can return home in safety. And do recall the UN's work on environmental action, biodiversity, protecting the air and the water that we breathe in common, as well as the UN's work on reproductive health, meaning safe birth, spacing children, having the means to decide when you will have children, as many, many countries respect, re request and need. I hardly need mention the UNICEF's remarkable work on the protection and health of children, or the World Health Organization on the public health issues of AIDS and malaria and SARS and tuberculosis and so on and the World Food Program's delivery of millions of tons of food to the famished. And even, I'll, I'll reach out to the cousins in the UN family, the International Postal Union, that allows us all to send a letter overseas and to know that it will indeed arrive. Recall, if you will, the UN's historic leadership on the issue of AIDS, convening the first global AIDS conference, which asked, indeed required, heads of state to address this scourge in their own countries. Think of the UN's work on behalf of the disabled and on behalf of the rights of women and so on. I could go on, but let me stop. It is, as it always has been, a forum for states large and small to confer, to debate, to persuade, to join forces, to share information, to publicize and dramatize their work and move us as a human race forward. Then, of course, there is the extended partnership of the UN with the universe of non-governmental organizations. There are 4,200 accredited to the UN in every area you can imagine, in peace and justice and human rights and health and, and so on and so on. And they all have their own deeply felt issues and they too join forces and help us not only at headquarters, but also in home capitals and also on the front lines. They are, in the Secretary General's words, our essential partners. And then, of course, UN works with parliaments and congresses and others committed to this cause in an effort to extend the family, the universe of people who work, who care, and who understand that this must be a common cause. It is easy to dismiss this and to say that the U.S. doesn't need such partners. But in an age when global crises clearly require global responses, how can we pretend that we can go it alone? The U.N., for all its flaws, continues to serve as that central forum for action. These are all matters that cross borders without passports. Terrorism, certainly. The epidemics, the flows of refugees, the matters of the environment, and so on. All matters that no one nation can address alone. That is, in my mind, self-evident. And on many, indeed most of these issues, the U.S. has over the years been active and committed and often has been a leader and has indeed benefited by sharing the burden, the risk, the cost, and we trust the benefit of joint action. It's often said that the U.S. 
doesn't want to be the policeman of the world, well, if not, then how better to share that responsibility than through the United Nations? Well, this long marriage, this 60-year marriage, has had its ups and downs from the beginning. Some have called it a love-hate relationship. But my concern is that this down is a little deeper than usual and a little more troubling than usual. Why, I would ask, is criticism of the UN today so harsh? Why does it seem to me sometimes that UN bashing has become a popular sport and that politicians find it so easy to dismiss and denigrate the organization? Why, I would ask, do they not recognize that the UN is us, all of us, that it is an instrument that reflects the will, the political will of the member states. It is an instrument to be well used. And when that political will is matched by resources, both human and financial, then anything is possible. Why do Americans not recognize the strengths and achievements of the United Nations and build on those? Why do they not acknowledge that when we, Americans, help others, we are in fact helping ourselves? And that the UN is the best possible way to leverage our influence and our concerns? Why do we not set the standard and serve as the role model as we did for so many years? And why do we do not demolish a few of those myths and misperceptions such as that the UN is a world government. It is not and never could be. It's a voluntary association of governments. Or that the UN is a, quote, threat to our sovereignty. It is not. It's an expression of sovereignty. It's an enhancement of our sovereignty. Or that myth that it's too expensive, we can't afford it. Well, it costs each of us, you and I, $1.65 a year to pay our dues in full. In New York, that's less than the price of a bus ride. And I do believe we can afford that. Why do we not make the most of this unique institution? Because I know I can tell you that indifference has consequences. We have seen time and time again that in the memorable words of Madeleine Albright, even superpowers need friends. Today, we risk losing some of our best friends and allies and creating a distance between us and our future friends as if we forget that dictatorships become democracies, that fragile democracies need help and support, that we ourselves went through 200 years and more to reach the point at which we are today. And our democracy had a few shaky moments in those early years. We have to acknowledge that we won't win the respect and cooperation of the rest of the world by military might alone. Indeed, we have military might. We have a lot of it. We have what they call hard power, economic power and military power to spare. Everyone knows that. But we have too seldom used that other precious resource, which I refer to as soft power the power of persuasion, the power of example, the power of our moral authority, the power of our ideas and our values. Indifference has consequences, so does abdication of leadership. If we Americans are unwilling to exercise our historic leadership role in the United Nations and to fulfill the legal obligations, such as paying our dues and setting the standards in principle and practice, then I really believe that we are witness to the decline, the inevitable decline of America on the world scene. I've seen it time and again that berating the UN is weakening it and bleeding it out. We can strengthen it, we can make it better, and we can do so conveying to the American public that it is a dollar well spent, 
that it is one that fulfills our obligation as the world leader, indeed the richest nation in the world, but one that, as I said before, shares that burden. And then you have a world community that looks to the U.S. not with resentment or fear, not as a bully who demands this and says do that, but as a natural leader whose words and deeds and principles and practice inspire support and emulation and partnership. Why should we do this? Well, as they say today, because we can, because we are so fortunate. We're blessed with health and safety. We're protected on either side of our country by great oceans from the ravages of war. And yet, and yet, even superpowers need friends. It's easy to say the UN needs the US, that's true, but I believe that the US needs the UN as well. How in this global neighborhood should America be a good neighbor and use its vast powers in ways that inspire respect? How do we put our values forward and use in a constructive way our impressive diplomatic skill? We will not win the war in Iraq on military strength alone. In this debate on America and the world, we need to look hard at our own behavior. And in this, I, I walk on delicate ground because I know there are deeply held views, differences of, of opinion on this subject. But let me share with you as a patriotic American, but also one who has served these many years inside UN, how it sometimes looks from there. And I would start by framing yet again a few questions we should ask ourselves. It is not unpatriotic, not unpatriotic, to ask why America is feared and sometimes hated. It is not unpatriotic to ask questions about the war in Iraq and the far-reaching and unintended consequences that are carrying along into the uncertain future. It is important that we pose questions now based on what we do know as truth about what we did two years ago when we went to war. Because now we're in Iraq in a situation of our own making and we are perceived by most of the world not, not, I regret to say, as liberators, but as occupiers. We are perceived as a Goliath, and the war on terrorism is perceived by many, and I choose my words with care, as not just a war on Iraq, but a war on Islam. We went to war, it now is clear on evidence that was flawed or false. We went to war on a date that was predetermined, regardless of what was going to happen in the Security Council debate. The U.S. dismissed the Security Council because they did not succeed in persuading nine out of 15 members of the Security Council that there were weapons of mass destruction, that we were in danger of imminent attack, and that therefore preemptive strike was required. None of those were true. The U.S., as we all know, chose to go it alone. They left the Security Council. Uh, they formed a coalition of sorts, and they went to war. That's history. They won that war in short order. We know that. And then they discovered something very important. This is the lesson. It is harder to make peace than it is to make war. We chose to go to war in a country that was not a haven for terrorists. In a country where the leader, Saddam Hussein, had no particular relationship, no cooperation with Osama bin Laden. 
We went to war in a country that was not a haven for terrorists, but has since become an incubator for terrorism and is now suffering through a series of bombings and terrible uh, insurgencies and, 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 and devastating attacks that they had never known before. Mind you, it is good that Saddam is gone. He was a terrible dictator, but there were five or six other dictators equally bad. I'd begin, I think, with the leader of North Korea. And we did divert precious resources into Iraq that could have been put to chasing down Osama bin Laden and the Taliban in Afghanistan, where their home base was. The mission is not accomplished. Because we went into this war, incredibly, with no plan for the peace. And having de dismissed the United Nations, we went to war with a, an appalling lack of experts in the region, with almost no linguists, very few who understood the deep complexities, religious, ethnic, and historic, of Iraq and the larger area. And now America has 150,000 troops there. Today we passed a sad mark with well over a thousand dead. Those are not just numbers, that's a thousand devastated families and several thousand maimed and tens of thousands of Iraqis, including children and women, killed. Most of our best friends and allies, the French and the Germans, the Belgians, the Dutch, the Mexicans, and the Canadians and the Brazilians and others, stood back because they were not persuaded by our argument in the Security Council. It was popular then to say the Security Council failed. It's not true. The American argument failed. And so now we're there, and well over 90% of the casualties are American, and well over 90% of the cost is American. And we are, uh, we are now at a cost of over $200 billion that is going to this war and not to health or education here. The coalition that was formed is dissolving the small contingents from the Dominican Republic and from Thailand and from Spain and, and from Italy have withdrawn. And the small contingents from Poland uh, are nearly bringing down their prime minister because the public disagrees so deeply. And even Tony Blair is in danger of losing his seat because there's such division in the British public over their participation in this war. It is seen as really in a, a war with an American face. If, as the first President Bush did in the Iraq War, we had been more tenacious, more patient, we might have gotten the support and the unique legitimacy from Security Council that we sought, but maybe not, because the evidence was very weak. This rather last week, we were on the verge of bombing the holy site of Najaf and making a martyr of the young Muslim cleric who led it, and last week, the army was pursuing their grim task of reviewing the abuses at the Abu Ghraib prison called, not abuses, but torture by the Geneva Convention. And those appalling photos flew around the world, even to the 40% of the Muslim world that is illiterate, and confirmed all the worst stereotypes of America as a bully, self-indulgent, licentious, and bent on humiliating and demeaning others. The image we hold dear of the good America, the generous America, the enlightened and just America, is not, I'm sorry to say, what much of the world is seeing today. And now, the US returns to the UN and says, help, can you help us? Can you help us with the drafting of the Constitution and the formation of the interim government and the restoration of the birth clinics that were devastated and the infant mortality rate is soaring and the training of the civil police? And can you help us by sending your UN people out to the villages, not in the green zone, mind you, where they're protected by razor wire and uh, concrete barriers, but out across the countryside 
to prepare for the first elections. Now they come to the UN recognizing the unique history and the wealth of talent, deep talent and knowledge that United Nations brings to bear and could have shared from the beginning had it been sought and respected. My friends, there is a lesson here. The U.S. cannot use the U.N. as an organization of convenience, just when it suits. The U.N. is not a lapdog. It has to be used as an organization of conviction, and that means through all the ups and downs, like a marriage, there are rough patches, and there are patches where you will disagree, where you won't win the debate, but you stay together because you know that in the long run, you have much to give each other. It is important to respect that and to stay through it and to persevere. That's the lesson we need to take to heart, we American citizens, and we need to convey that to our representatives in Congress and our leaders in the administration. We need to let them know that we know and we care and we vote. Well, what would a good neighbor do as a country? If you allow me this presumption, just briefly I'll, I'll mention a few things. As a country, it would be important that our principles and our practice match. America likes to promote and, and, and preach democracy. Yes, indeed. And yet, and yet, we support dictators time and again. Do you remember President Marcos in the Philippines? And President Pinochet in Chile? And President Mobutu in Zaire? And do you remember that Saddam Hussein was our man in Iraq for many years and we supported him in the, the, the war between Iran and Iraq? And do you recall that it was in fact the Americans who trained and armed the early Taliban in Afghanistan because at that moment they were fighting the Russians, the Soviets? The lesson in this is we need to take great care who our partners are. And we need to think long into the future and to remember that what America does and says is remembered and noted by everybody. We need, if I can be so bold, as to suggest that we need to keep our promises. Just one example. We promised that we would really help Afghanistan, did we not? Well, President Karzai is a remarkable man but he's only able to function as the mayor of Kabul. Our promised delivery of both uh, financial and human resources has barely come through at the absolute minimum. And not for the first time, this happened once before years back, that we essentially abandoned Afghanistan. If we make promises, we need to keep them. Another thing, we need to sign treaties. Why do I say that? Because there are now at least 11 major international treaties where the U.S. has been part of the drafting and the creation of those treaties from the beginning, not over days, mind you, but over weeks and years, months and years. And yet when it came time to ratify and sign and put in motion these treaties, we have stood back and said everybody else but not us. That's an example of what's called American exceptionalism. Let me quickly mention a couple of them. You'll be surprised. We have not signed the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty on Nuclear Arms, the Convention to Ban Land Mines, the Convention on the Rights of the Children, the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the Kyoto Treaty on the Environment and Global Warming, and the Law of the Sea Treaty that protect, protects the resources under the sea, which we all have in common. We have chosen not to sign the International Criminal Court and gone further and penalized, punished those countries that in their own best interests saw fit to sign on to the ICC. We did sign the Convention Against Genocide, but it took us 40 years to do so. Why can we not join the family of nations?
with the full understanding that these treaties are not perfect. You or, my, you or I might di disagree with 0.5 or 0.13 or whatever, but they are good. And they reflect the best that experts from all sides, including Americans, could bring to bear on that issue. And they move us as a human race forward. And yet time and again, and I haven't gone through the whole list, we do not join. Why do we not pay our contribution, as we did for three decades, to the UN Fund for Population, for Family Planning? For the last three years, the Congress authorized that. The administration put a lock on it, and not a dime has gone for this important function. That's a pity. Why do we not listen better? And if I may use a word that I've heard said, but not always practiced, why can't we listen with humility? We're a mighty power. If we listen better, if we listen more quietly, if we convey a measure of respect to some other countries, large and small, it would serve us well. And why can we not hold our standards? We, as a country, believe that everyone deserves uh, access to the law or a lawyer, even prisoners. And yet we hold prisoners in Guantanamo, many hundreds of them, without any communications or any representations. Why can we not contribute more to the poorest of the poor? It is true that although we like to think we're exceedingly generous, the fact is that of all the industrialized nations, we come in dead last, last in our contribution across the world. Why can we not educate Americans everywhere to look beyond our borders, to learn foreign languages, to embrace the possibilities for student exchange and, and visits of exchanges of local officials and teachers and business leaders and, and promote sister city programs and encourage the Peace Corps. Why do we not more frequently tap in to our local communities of refugees and invite them to come and speak about their experience? which is usually a powerful story, a compelling story, of what they went through to come here. Why don't we open the circles of our own churches or synagogues or mosques and make an effort to make the other human, to give them a face? Why don't we learn more about Islam, which is growing and here to stay? And why don't we know that as Americans or as a country, our words have meaning and consequence and are heard round the world? I would hope that all of us on these issues speak up loud and clear and look for leaders who are visionaries and understand both the use of power and the misuse of power and understand that we can use the UN, I say use in the positive sense, as that instrument for peace and progress and use it with respect and skill and support the public service and the diplomatic service that is there in New York and in our foreign embassies around the world, and make sure that that political will is matched by the resources, and that we do indeed pay our UN dues, which went for 12 years without payment, and pay that in full, on time, and without condition. Why don't we remember the very fine words of Eleanor Roosevelt, who said that, police, that, that peace begins in small ways close to home, and yet understand that we Americans can do more and can reach far abroad. Clearly, the UN has its limits, but it also has more possibilities than anyone has ever uh, explored. The UN can't solve every problem, but it does go where others won't. It can't do it alone as an entity. It doesn't have that autonomy. It needs the mandates of the member states. And when the US, when the superpower, when the leading member of Security Council, which is the US, are fully engaged 
and involved. And when leaders, whether it's college presidents or teachers or principals or religious leaders or members of Congress or uh, people in the administration, including the president, when they talk about the UN uh, with respect and not disdain, when they stop the cheap shot of ridiculing UN as if it didn't matter, as if we were only the only nation that counted, when they speak of it res with respect and therefore empower it and convey that respect to Americans at large and teach by example, if you will, then everything becomes uh, more possible. The difference to people around the world is real. It means to many freedom, democracy, health, justice, hope, and opportunity. And that is the birthright, not just of Americans, not just of those of us fortunate be, to be born in this great democracy. That is the birthright of every child on earth. For your interest in these subjects, for your willingness to think about these difficult issues, for your sharing what I believe you do is the hope to make this country the best it can possibly be, I salute you and I thank you. Yeah, first of all, thank you for that uh, speech and that list of questions. Where are you? I can't see. Oh, thank um, this. The light is uh, which uh, uh, many of those questions of, of the U.S. government I've uh, asked uh, rhetorically myself. Um, is the U.N. going to uh, have observers for the upcoming election to make sure that we actually get a government of the people, by the people, and for the people this time? Please. You mean the American election? <laughs> well, we do have expert election monitors. Most of them are deployed in overseas in, in new democracies. Um, I don't think there will be UN election monitors uh, in an official capacity, but believe me, everybody in the UN is watching this election with keen attention. And uh, if it goes smoothly, if it goes fairly, and so on, um, that will set a very important example. I'm told that there will be election monitors of, uh, uh, that is, American monitors, uh, quite how they're to be deployed and from where they come, I'm not entirely sure. But uh, everyone will, I think everyone will be assured if we feel comfortable that this is, of course, as they always say, a free and fair election. Okay, in the man in the blue shirt, and then I'll get to you, sir. I was doing a little math and realized the United States with our 300 million people, um, it may be presumptuous that we consider it a marriage to an organization that represents six billion people. We're only, what, five or six percent of the world. That's right. Though we spend half the money in the world on arms. So we're um, exceptional, mm -hmm. uh, but not in numbers. So perhaps what we're looking for is a reason that the United States would willingly become a member of the community of nations. And we're held back by a cynical self-interest that says it's not to our benefit to sign this treaty or to participate in that decision. Um, so to the cynics who think in self-interest, uh, I guess I'm asking for vision. Yeah. What's in it for the United States to join that community of nations? Um, I respectfully disagree with the premise that it's not in our national interest. It, it is. It is possible for us to further the national interest and the global interest both. Maybe not every time, but by and large it is. Sometimes it will require compromising a bit. But, did I use this phrase before, we're not a nation apart. By moving the entire issue forward on those treaties, we're helping 
the world at large. Now, the treaty issue is, is interesting and complicated, and each one has its own story. It's not time to go into all of that. But the important thing to recall on this is that in this country, we need both the ratification by Congress as well as the signature of the president for a treaty to go forward. And what has happened is that a small number, probably not more than 10 hardcore congressmen, hard right congressmen, have decided that they are not going to support an international treaty ever, ever, no matter what. And so there's nothing that can come forward that would persuade or, or convince them that it is in our interest. They simply disagree with the notion that we would sign anything and they somehow imagine that it is uh, uh, um, diminishing or, or, or giving up something precious. On the contrary, it's enhancing us. It's moving us forward. And when America signs, then we're on the inside. If you leave the, the, the football game and stand out there, you have no chance to influence either the victory or the loss. But if you're on the team, if you're a player, you can build upon the strengths and address the weaknesses and, and, and move it forward. So on the treaty issue, I understand that there there may be something that's not great, um, but remember that the U.S. was part of the drafting, so they weren't taken by surprise on this. They had years or, or more to, to, uh, to work those details out. Um, it, is, it is simply short-sighted to stand back, and it says to the rest of the world, you go that way, we don't need you, we don't care. It's not a good message to send. Um, no, in front. There is a, a series of popular evangelical novels called the Left Behind series. And the, the main antichrist in the Left Behind series is the president of the United Nations. And this is a series which has sold, been on the New York Times bestseller list for years. Why do you think that the United Nations has such a bad reputation among grassroots Americans? Why can this novel be so popular? And why do normal average Americans feel that the United Nations either is bad, it's a, it is something that the Antichrist will eventually take over, or they don't even know what the initials UN stand for? Yeah. I. I've heard of this series. I've I've not read it. it yeah. <laughs> which which certainly says something about your position. Yeah. And this is what I'm saying. You know, yeah. why is it that there's this gap? It's it's fascinating to me because um, it's it's pure fantasy. But I'll, I'll hazard a guess at this. Um, some people need something to hate in order to define themselves. They are animated, they are activated, if you will, by having something specific in front of them uh, to hate or to act against. For many years that was communism. And with the death of communism, people scanned the horizon and they said, well, who else? Ah, the United Nations. And I'm sometimes stunned, really astounded at some of the, the, the falsities, the nonsense that I read in this regard. But I will say it's not accidental. Some of it is fed very deliberately. And I'm not paranoid on this because I've seen the materials, I've studied them, um, by a, a cadre of, of career UN bashers who, uh, it's true, who are experts on the internet and whose main purpose in life is to demean or demolish, demolish the United Nations. Oliver North and his group out of West Virginia or Virginia uh, is a good one, check it out. We occasionally do what politicians would call opposition research because I think it's important to know what the anti-UN people are saying. When I see it, what fascinates me is that it is based on utterly false premises. 
So what do we do about that? Is it an issue of education? Do they simply not know? Is it an issue of leadership? Is it an issue of someone like me coming out and trying to debate and reason and set it in place and place the larger frame and, and talk about them or invite them to come visit the United Nations and see that people there don't have horns, they're human beings? Um, how do we persuade people who are convinced of such things? that the UN is an organization, I think I said earlier, it's a voluntary organization of, 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 of governments that's trying to do good work. Do they find it threatening? Is it because there are foreigners there? Somebody said to me, oh, it's all those too many foreigners there. Well, well, yes, of course, that's the idea. How could they say such a thing? I mean that the UN reflects the face of humanity. That's the very idea. To me, that's a joy that's infinitely interesting and, and marvelous and stimulating. Why should that be a threat to see those faces that don't look like mine and to come to know them as human beings and interesting people and people who actually share a lot of common cause with myself? Maybe these people are so strange and different they may come from Mars or some other place. Um, this is one reason I'm making this circuit of speeches and I do often talk to uh, student groups and not as often as I'd like to anti-UN groups. Um, it's quite interesting when I do. Some, I mean there are a range of reasons why people disagree. But I have discovered that there is a core group that is convinced beyond reason, or should I say without reason, that the UN is a threat uh, and nothing, nothing will dissuade them. Not evidence, not proof, not discussion. There is no way they can be convinced and there's no way they can have an open, thoughtful discussion about it. And at that point you have to say, well, I'm sorry, I hope you'll come to see it another way, another day. Um, but for those who are open to the discussion, I think we all have a, a lot to learn and, and I hope you'll come visit the UN. Come see it. Come take the tour. Come, come, come get a better sense of what it's like and how hard people work there and how much hope is invested in the organization and, and how difficult it is and, and how also how rewarding it is too. Come feel that, that sense that it is a joined effort of the world at large. And we Americans have a huge stake in that success and an enormous amount to contribute as well as an enormous amount to benefit when we do that well. <laughs>